I'd like to start by asking you to close your eyes. Close your eyes, and I want you to, vis I want you to be on, visualize being on your favorite recliner. Turn the TV on, getting ready to watch a movie, and that movie is about a prison. So I want you to visualize what a prison warden looks like. Close your eyes. He's a man, he's bald, big shoulders, scowly look on his face. And I'll bet you, if it was a movie filmed in the South, he's got a cigar sticking out of his mouth and he spits. <laughs> now open your eyes. <laughs> Seriously, I am a real life prison warden. I am the first real life female prison warden from the Iowa State Penitentiary. I'm not a man, I have hair, I'm not that big. I don't smoke a cigar. Now, I did grow up on a farm with four brothers, so I'll let you decide if I spit or not. <laughs> Being a warden is my dream job. I've wanted to be a warden since junior high, and I'm sure there's many people in this audience tonight that also wanted to be a warden when they were in junior high. <laughs> I'm sure, like many of you, I visited prisons in high school. I subscribed to prison newspapers in high school. <laughs> it's a true story, I'm not making this up. It's what I always wanted to do, it's my dream job. So I started my career as a 21-year-old naive farm girl, and the first prison I worked at was bigger than my hometown. When I first walked into the prison, I visualized it as stark, razor wire, concrete, full of inmates that were supposed to do what staff told them to do. I never visualized them as individuals with stories or histories. I never visualized them as people that were sorry and remorseful for their crimes. And I certainly never visualized the effect their crimes had on their families or their victims. So I started my career at Stateville Correctional Center in Joliet, Illinois in 1979. A lot of movies, it was a 5,000 bed maximum security prison. A lot of movies were filmed at Stateville. Uh, the Blues Brothers, a lot of you probably have seen The Blues Brothers. And when I was there, Will was filmed there. It was a story about G. Gordon Liddy's um, participation in the Watergate scandal. And the star of that film that played G. Gordon Liddy was Robert Conrad. I was one of his escorts, so that was pretty cool for a 21-year-old girl from the farm. He also told me I could strip search him. <laughs> I did not, probably one of my regrets in life, but I did not do that. <laughs> I met my first serial killer while I was at Stateville. Some of you may remember Richard Speck. He murdered, raped, and tortured eight student nurses in 1966 in the south side of Chicago. He originally received the death penalty and it was later changed to serve 400 to 1200 years in prison. By the time I got to Stateville, he was the prison painter and he was supposed to paint my office. He came in, he was a pretty quiet guy, we didn't talk very much, and I was doing my work and he was painting. All of a sudden I looked up and I realized I'm in a room alone with a man that raped and tortured and killed eight women. Slightly intimidating, but I love my career. I love my job. I love the excitement, I love the challenge, and if I'm honest, I love a little bit of the danger that occurs every day when you walk into a maximum security prison. So I left Stateville and I started at the Iowa State Penitentiary in 1983. My job there was the same as it was at Stateville, except Fort Madison was much smaller. Maximum security male, 550 was a population versus 5,000 at Stateville, which was bigger than my hometown. So uh, at Fort Madison, my job was the same. I enforced the rules, I made sure they didn't escape, and they did what they were supposed to do. So I was there 15 years, and I got a few promotions while I was there, working my way up that ladder to my ultimate dream job. So I left uh, Fort Madison in the late 90s and I started working with females. And that really was the beginning of my change and my philosophy and my views of what prisons and inmates were. 
So I started working with female offenders, and females are much different than men. They serve their time differently. They're much less violent. They have much more instances of mental illness. And I'm not exaggerating when I say 80 to 90% of the women in prison have some sort of trauma history. They've either been sexually, physically, or emotionally abused. One of the women I worked with on a regular basis was mentally ill, and part of her mental illness was hallucinations. She would see ladybugs or spiders. If she was seeing spiders, it was a bad day. If she was seeing ladybugs, it was a good day. So she was sitting across from me from my office one day, and I knew she was hallucinating because she kept watching my shoulder, and she kept saying, Patty, there's a spider on your shoulder. I said, no, no, there's not. It's your hallucinations. But to bring her anxiety down a little bit, I let her gently brush that spider that she saw in her mind off my shoulder. She would sit in my office and sob and tell me about the abuse she endured when she was a little girl. At that time, McDonald's Happy Meals gave away little figurines about this big in their little Happy Meal sacks, and she collected those, and she lined them up on her windowsill, single file. And she said that's what she focused on when she was being abused, was those Happy Meal McDonald's little figurines. She killed a man, and that's why she was serving time in the state of Iowa. In the late, or in, night, in 2017, I left Mitchellville, and I returned to the Iowa State Penitentiary in my dream job as a warden. I thought I could take some of the experiences that I learned with the females and apply it to the males in the maximum security prison in Fort Madison. Although I know male maximum security inmates and the prison is much different than a medium security women's prison. Men are much more violent. There's, they have many more security issues than the women do. 75% of the men at Fort Madison have um, victims. And I learned a valuable lesson while I was at Mitchellville. Uh, while I was there, we were also doing a construction project and we knew when we got done with that construction project that we wanted it to look different than the typical prison. We wanted it to be full of trees, green plants, colorful plants, and that's what we built. We built a lot, we planted a lot of trees and a lot of green flowers, a lot of native grass, and made it look attractive. We also built an outdoor classroom uh, so the women could actually work outside in nature and work with their counselors to work on their issues, whatever their issues may be. During this time, a local TV station ran a story on our landscaping project because we partnered with Iowa State University. I thought it would be a positive story. I was not prepared for a phone call that I got from a granddaughter of a woman that one of our women killed. She says, Warden, I don't think it's right that the person that brutally murdered my grandma should live in a nice prison. She had a point, so we talked. She listened, I listened, she talked, I talked. And I explained to her what my goals was as a warden. I said, my job is to give the women opportunities to make the changes they need to make so they don't return to prison. They have to feel safe so they can work on their issues, whether it's mental health, whether it's relationships, whether it's parenting, whatever their issues are, they have to feel like they're in a safe environment to make those changes. And part of their physical surroundings is part of that change. And if we can get the women to make those changes and not return to prison, the chances of their children following in their footsteps is also reduced. So we had a great conversation. We hung up, she still didn't agree with me, but she understood what I was trying to do. So I thought I could take some of those same principles that I learned at Mitchellville to Fort Madison. Keeping in mind it's a maximum security prison, keeping in mind that 75% of, of the guys at Fort Madison are serving violent crimes and there's a lot of victims out there. And I never forgot the lesson that I learned from that granddaughter of one of the women we had at Mitchellville. So I thought, okay, let's start small. We started with a vegetable garden. Surely there's nothing wrong with growing a vegetable garden inside a maximum security prison, although think about it, can it be done safely? They use tools. I thought we could put mechanisms in place to make it safe. We had some people that was concerned, warden, what if the inmates use one of their tools and assaulted staff? That's possible. So we put measures in place so that didn't happen, and we planted that vegetable garden. Every year, that thing has gotten bigger, 
I have never seen one weed in that garden. Not one weed. The guys take such great pride in it, growing it from, wheat, from little seeds or plants into produce that they can eat, and it saved the state money because we was buying less produce. And it was very satisfying for me as a warden to watch them, and I'd see staff and inmates along the side of the garden having very pro-social, professional conversations about different planting strategy, and apparently there's lots of different planting strategies in gardens. And that was a farming community, so you can imagine all the advice that the guys got. We did have one incident last fall, though. Another inmate that had nothing to do with the garden got upset. He went over to that garden and started pulling up plants. Well, the three guys that were working on this garden were standing over here with those tools in their hands. They didn't move. Staff came and took away the inmate that was tearing up the plants. And after it was all over, the security director went over to those three guys and said, thank you for not doing what we knew you were thinking about doing to this guy that was tearing up all your hard work. They said, heck no, you'd have taken away our garden and you would have taken away our tools. Yeah, we would have done that. So the next thing I wanted to do was introduce pets at Fort Madison. So we went to a local animal shelter and we adopted two small lap dogs and we named them Thelma and Louise. <laughs> you have to have a sense of humor when you work in a prison. So we introduced Thelma and Louise to our assisted living unit, which is kind of like a nursing home. These were older guys, the oldest guy was 93, and they all have health issues and they need extra care. Those two dogs immediately changed the whole atmosphere of that unit. Guys started smiling more. Some guys started coming out of the room that never wanted to come out of the room to interact with those dogs. We had one guy that was in hospice care uh, when we brought the dog in, and Thelma could sense this guy was dying, and she laid on his feet for the last couple days of his life. I've seen big, burly, tattooed guys get tears in their eyes when they're holding and petting those little lap dogs. They hadn't touched a dog in 10, 15, 20, and some of them over 30 years. It was meaningful to them. Now, don't get the wrong idea. I am not a bleeding heart liberal. I believe in holding people accountable and holding people responsible. But it's not my, judge, it's not my job to judge what they did when they come to me. The judge and the jury already did that. It's my job to make sure that they're safe from each other and sometimes safe from themselves. It's my job to make sure that staff are safe and staff goes home every night. There are some truly evil people in prison. There are truly some people in prison that need to stay there for the rest of their lives. I had one guy tell me why he murdered somebody. Just business, Patty. He had a smile on his face, he shrugged his shoulders, and he said, it's just business, Patty. Society is better off with him locked away for the rest of his life. But in my experience, I truly believe 80% of the men and women in prison are sorry for their crimes, and they're remorseful for what they've done. I spent a lot of time in the visiting room over the years. For those lucky enough to get visits, uh, some people get a lot of visits, some people get no visits. So I've watched moms hug their sons goodbye when it's time to leave, and you can see the fear in her eyes because she's leaving her son in a maximum security prison. I've seen those same sons hug their moms goodbye, and you can see the regret in their face for causing mom all this pain. I've literally seen small children pride from their mom's arms at Mitchellville because they didn't want to leave mom at the end of the visit. So I knew someday when I got the opportunity, I wanted to make the visiting room a positive experience. So at Fort Madison, we started a family meal. The inmate had to be three years report free, which isn't always easy in a maximum security setting. They had to be three years report free. Their visitor had to go through the background process. They go through a metal detector and they're searched. The prison cooks the food and it happens in a visiting room. So there really are no security issues there. Uh, we had a couple guys that play in a prison band, and they would play some music in the background for some nice little soft music. I had one inmate tell me for two hours he could almost forget he was in prison. 
I had a mom tell me that it was the first real meal she had with her son in 35 years, because that's how long he'd been incarcerated. Because usually in the visiting room, you just get vending machine food. And I had one mom tell me at the end of a, a family visit, she stood up and she gave me a hug and she said, Patty, he's still my son. So I left Fort Madison last month. After 36 years with the Iowa Department of Corrections, I retired. I started as that naive farm girl that thought prisons had to be gray and full of razor wire and depressing and, guy, and it was full of guys that wore blue chambray shirts with their prison number over their breast pocket. After those 36 years, what I learned was that prisons are full of men and women that are moms and dads that are still loved by their families. Prisons are full of men and women that made mistakes. They're remorseful and sorry for their crimes. Prisons are full of men and women that can change, and they've showed me that people do change. And they've shown me that even in depressing situations, your life can be meaningful. So whether I took care of your son because he was incarcerated, or I took care of the drunk driver that killed your daughter, I tried to do so with respect and decency. Thank you.